Good morning and welcome. This is TV on the radio or radio on the TV. Uh, we've got an exciting hour lined up for you, um, live from living rooms, bedrooms, um, and a variety of other locations across South Africa as we talk about the 10th South African Radio Awards, uh, proudly hosted by Arena Events and Arena Holdings. This year, uh, more than 2,000 entries into the Radio Awards. Uh, there were 60 judges, um, 160 stations participating. It was an audited situation. Uh, there were 10 uh, advisors on advisory panel that uh, partook. Uh, and today, joining us, uh, we've got two of the winning stations uh, that walked away with top honors on the evening. Uh, Kai FM uh, being the commercial radio station of the year, Tux FM being the campus radio station of the year, Radio 2000 won a public radio service of the year, and Hot FM won the community radio station of the year. So I'd like to take this opportunity this morning to welcome up, uh, firstly, uh, Greg Maloka, who's the uh, MD at Kaya. Also like to take the opportunity to welcome Leanne Kuntz, who's the station manager at Tux FM in Pretoria. And then we've got uh, two media people joining us this morning as well. Kaebe Molo, uh, he's the head of marketing at African Bank, who's also no stranger to the radio landscape in the research I did beforehand. I see Kaebe's uh, invested in radio stations like Power. They've been involved in the Metro Music Awards. Uh, they've also done stuff with Kaya and East Coast Radio's Big Walk. And then lastly, he calls himself uh, Africa's oldest surviving media planner. Uh, he's a <laughs> podcaster a general media guru. We're also joined this morning by Gordon Miller. So I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome and thank our panel for the time this morning. Uh, we are obviously live tweeting, so you can get on, uh, you can find the SA Radio Awards and you can uh, send us your questions uh, and do ask uh, your questions on the, the live chat and we'll take it from there. We'll be uh, asking the panelists to answer some of the questions as we go out through the morning. So I think first up, I mean, I thought to myself, am I going to be able to not say coronavirus or COVID in the next hour? And I think the reality of where we are is it's impossible because everyone's talking about the new normal. They're talking about when we get back. Um, and it's obviously had an impact on our business. Um, Leanne, I'd like to kick off with you. I mean, in a minute, uh, could you give me an idea of where do you think um, radio is currently and especially with the coronavirus, what's happening in your space? Well, for us specifically, we've had to be very innovative just to stay on air. And I think that's been a problem or an issue for a lot of people, not only in the radio space, but just for people to remain operational. We've had to innovate um, to change our models in some cases entirely. Um, we've moved entirely online simply because we operate obviously from, from a university campus and that has been completely shut down to students. So we've had to move online entirely, 100%. Um, we're essentially broadcasting via WhatsApp, which is something that, you know, we've never done before. Um, so I think streaming in the digital space is obviously going to be a massive, massive thing following this whole pandemic. Um, and it will continue to be something that is even more um, in our faces and part of our daily lives than it has been, specifically in the radio space. So I know we've seen streaming increasing vastly, streaming audio consumption. Um, so I think things like hearables, especially for a youth market, um, these are the kinds of things that are going to start to become a trend or more so of a trend in the radio space. Um, audio consumption via streaming, as I mentioned, um, even video consumption. Um, these are the kinds of things that I think that, that has been propelled by, by the pandemic that we're currently facing. Kaibe, when we take a look at the radio business uh, in 2020, um, as a brand, you would have had a radio and a media strategy. With the coronavirus taking over, what has that meant for radio and your brand specifically? I guess, um, interestingly, radio and obviously TV have probably been beneficiaries to an extent, uh, but in a different way. So whereas perhaps we were initially looking for drive time or for peak listening periods, you're now suddenly finding that that has changed. You know, you can pretty much advertise almost anywhere during the day, even though you still look for appropriate environments and ideally where you're gonna find the numbers. Um, what has also been interesting is that one of the things that we've started a while ago, um, 
and Greg knows very well, we've always, we had always tried to use radio, not just as the audio part, but the social, the online, the relationships with the presenters. Um, back then, we were also trying to do stuff on the ground. So you're now using radio, not just as the audio experience, but you're trying to use it as a full, almost 360 experience. What can the listener and the viewer see as well as here? And how else do they see you on the device, whether that's in the web environment or in the social environment? So we've seen our spend and our environments in radio change. Um, and we've seen more money come in because there are environments that we've had to move money away from um, because there are just very few audiences there. Thanks, Kaibe. Radio has often been referred to as the original social media. And through what Kaibe and Leanne have said, social is definitely a thing. Gordon, um, I know that you used to listen to David Gresham on the ra radio. Um, it's been four decades of you working in this business. In 2020, what does the radio landscape look like? And are we doing enough? Well, the, the short and sad answer to that, it looks probably much the same as it did, you know, 40 years ago, except there's more stations. Um, you know, looking at the overall trend, it, it, what my concern is that the radio industry just hasn't progressed much beyond trying to, to research and sell audiences. And if I'm listening to Caribe and listening to Leanne, and I believe they are on the money, it's increasingly about communities. And you know, we, we are just continuing to measure radio in a, in a solitary kind of silo, and we give more money to the guys who, who to, you know, can appear to demonstrate that they have more listeners and thousands. But what's intriguing for me is when I look at the radio awards, it's not necessarily the big players that walked away with the money or walked away with the prizes, I should say. You know? So what is the disconnect between the investors in radio stations and the people who judge the stations? We award the stations on their performance across a whole range of metrics, but they seem only to get advertising based on one metric, which is the number of listeners. That's 40-year-old thinking, and that, for me, is the most distressing stuff. We, we know what we need to do. We need to step up to the plate, and we need to start putting a value to the kinds of things Leanne and Kay are talking about. How do you put a value to quality of audience, not just number of listeners? Greg, you've got both. You've got quality of audience with the Afropolitans, and you've got numbers with Kai just under a million um, year on year or diary on diary or however you want to see it. Um, in yes. 2020, the radio landscape and Kai FM, what does it look like? Um, I mean, it's it's obviously changed, um, you know, in, in that a few years ago, we we understood a few things. Um, one, we understood that exactly to Gordon's point. Uh, in fact, we, we worked on, on, on a project together, but, you know, maybe eight years ago, um, you know, around being able to, um, you know, bring out these um, different communities and these different groups and to show value beyond numbers um, you know to show that you know every every brand has to find its own 16 percent you know those people who are your your natural advocates um, and it's generally 16 percent of the market it's never anything more than that um, and the trick with that is obviously you know you you always want to go to to the advertiser with um, you know, a large number because, again, as Gordon says, 40 years ago, still today, people say, well, you know, if you don't have a million listeners, don't, don't really have a conversation with us. But, you know, we had to try and balance those two things over the years. So on, on the one hand, we had to balance the strength of the many communities that exist, even within just the Afropolitan uh, segment. Um, but also, um, you know, being able to provide a number of platforms, um, you know, for these different communities to be able to, um, uh, you know, explore uh, the Kai world. I mean, I think, you know, all of these things started off with, um, you know, being clear that you are not a radio station, you're an ecosystem, you are a part of a lifestyle. People, some people will want to see you, some people will want to read about you, some people will want to hear you, um, you know, some will want to watch you. Um, so already years ago, we started creating, uh, you know, Kaya TV, we started creating, um, you know, uh, Jazzbury, which is an online version of our, of 
by jazz. Uh, it's, it's just jazz, pure jazz station for Kai, because we've got you know heads that love jazz. Um, you know, we, we we opened a shop, so there are a variety of um, uh, platforms that talk about you know the the same person's livelihood, the same person's you know internal conflicts, the things that they worry you know about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you move yourself away from the tradition of radio, really, into a multi-platform environment where you're having multi-platform conversations with people. So, Greg, I mean, what you're talking about is you're talking about the evolution of radio. Gordon alluded to the fact that we haven't um, done enough. Um, Post-COVID-19, uh, what do you think the radio landscape is going to do? Are we going to continue uh, to look at technological platforms? Uh, where is content going? Uh, and how important is traditional FM, especially in a time like this? Um, again, I mean, I think, you know, for my, my view has always been that, um, you know, FM is just a, a channel. And I think we've placed a lot of definition and emphasis on FM as if it is the be all and end all of something. I mean, it's just, it's merely a channel through which you distribute a type of content. Um, you know, the, the important thing is how many connection points do you need and how many platforms do you need to be able to carry on the conversation with the people that you're talking to? Um, and, and, you know, and, and the problem as, as well is that, you know, radio stations are, are going to fundamentally change, especially ones that, you know, look at themselves at, as an FM kind of uh, platform, because what, what will happen is post COVID, there'll be a lot of business questions that are asked. Um, you know, how many people have you got in your team? You know, how many do you really need? You know, what has working away from uh, the office meant? Does this mean we can, you know, because it's all about cost cutting. I mean, we, uh, cost cutting, sorry. Because I mean, we also need to remember that, you know, pre-COVID we were in a very uh, um, lazy economy. You know, we're in an economy that wasn't growing. You know, so this is just compounded by that. So if you've always thought of yourself as just one street, then then you're simply going to die in that particular street. Uh, but if you've been able to um, you know, you know, create a variety of you know spaces and places where where people can catch you. Um, then you you know are most likely to survive. You know, people are watching uh, a lot of uh, digital uh, television right now. So you know, a, a car TV, for instance, is still relevant. A, a you know, so diff different streams, the apps, all the stuff that you use to still communicate uh, is there. The, the, the king remains content, really, more than anything else. It's just which platform do you use for that? We're celebrating 10 years of the SA Radio Awards. We're joined by Greg Maloka, who's the MD of Kai FM. Leanne Kunz is the station manager of Tax FM. Kai B. Molo is the head of marketing at African Bank. And Gordon uh, Miller uh, is a media guru uh, in the South African land space uh, and a strategist. Uh, Kai B., I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of, of current spend um, and, and marketing budget, um, are brands leveraging what radio is currently doing to their best advantage? I know African Bank have been quite active on television. Uh, you were on during the president's speech the other night. Um, is, is radio a platform that you're thinking to yourself, this is an opportunity that we should utilize now? <laughs> I wouldn't want to talk on behalf of other brands. Um, I, I think we're trying to leverage radio as much as possible, um, but we're trying to leverage radio not as a station. I think to what Greg has just been talking about, we're trying to leverage the radio opportunity as a means of engaging, interacting with, and at the worst level, reaching various audiences. So. We don't want to just put out ads there. We want to put out, we want to find audiences, whether they are listening to the radio, whether they are going online to find out about information, whether they are following the radio presenter or the DJ, whether they are looking at, the, at that presenter via some kind of web, webcam or whatever. We're trying to make sure that we're all we're in as many environments as possible and not just talk at an audience, ideally engage with, interact with, give 
audiences the opportunity to talk to us, engage with us, ask us the questions that they've always wanted to ask us, um, and give them as much information as they as we can, while giving it to them in a way that makes sense. Um, one of the things that for me is the best thing about radio is that it allows you to actually talk to audiences in their language, not just in a language that they understand. So the stations that we've talked about here are all perhaps predominantly English speaking stations, but what radio allows us to do and why we spend perhaps quite a bit in radio is you can speak to audiences in a language that is theirs and therefore touches that emotional part of, of them more than just the rational and the functional. So we are trying to use radio across that biggest land landscape or that biggest spectrum of how we can connect as opposed to just, I think, as a means to communicate information or communicate ads um, and, 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 and put out advertising. We're actually looking for those opportunities to connect. I'd, I'd like to come back to you in a moment, Kaybe, about uh, ad spend and particularly community radio. Gordon, uh, the next question to you, in the last five weeks, I've been spending a lot of time listening to radio on a variety of platforms. I've been exposed to national radio, some community radio, and a lot of regional radio. There have been some quality issues with people broadcasting from home and uh, things like that, but I mean, I think one understands it during this time. The thing that struck me, though, is that I sometimes get the overarching feeling that I'm getting bored that there's not enough going on. Are radio stations working hard enough at creating content and entertainment? Yeah, look, it's 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 hard to to break out of the cycle of COVID and post-COVID and all that kind of stuff. So whether you're talking about newspapers, whether you're talking radio, television, um, everything has got bogged down, quite frankly. And I think we're all of us getting bored. When I started off, you know, in lockdown, I set myself an objective to do a lockdown comrades marathon and you know going for a walk every day was like really a bit of a nuisance now i, I celebrate it i keep checking my watch i want to go out because i'm so sick and tired of it all so i, I mean i think it is what it is and it, we just need somebody who's courageous enough to break out and start talking about something else or offer something slightly differently and i think there are stations whose formats lend themselves to that and not punting any one particular station, but Classic FM, for instance, has a format which if you're looking for time out, you can go in and listen. But the problem that the local stations face is, is already been alluded to. My choice is not limited to the 400 odd stations in, in South Africa. I, I'm listening to my favorite radio station, which comes out of South Wabash in Chicago, because I've been to Buddy Guy's Club and that's the community station that plays his music and the music of, of that part of Chicago, that's what you're up against. If you want to make it interesting for me, you know, you, you're really up against other things, um, streaming radio formats, whether, you know, whatever it is. Um, and and that's, that's the challenge. It's not enough just to be top dog here. You've got to be top dog in the world if you want to keep my interest beyond uh, you know, where, where it is at any one point in time. And yeah, and I think, you know, the other, challenge that many formats face is that because you have a, a user generated content and I know we'll talk about that a bit later format i.e talk radio um, you know you, you're trying to rely on interesting listeners to make you know the, the shift and dynamic but Stan Katz called that one you know 30 years ago when he started 702 he said you know only 10 percent of our listeners call in the other 90 percent have got lives so I, I can't wait for lockdown to start from eight till five. So the crazy people, you know, just hopefully can't get near a radio set because if you try to listen in in the morning, the crazy people wake up at five o'clock. I'm hoping they're going to sleep in. If you enjoy what Gordon says, he also has a weekly podcast that you can go and tune into. He's done four comrades marathons and 70 ultra marathons. So I believe him when he says he's been walking around his house. Leanne, we've got a question for you from... Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who's uh, asked via our online platform about the management and motivating people when they're remote from you. So you've got a team broadcasting from all over. Uh, there's a lot of communication. They're WhatsApping each other. There's content flying around. How do you keep it all together and how do you motivate them to make sure that your product is still good? 
Yeah, it's extremely difficult. It's something that we work on literally every minute of every day. Um, our major mode of communication at this stage, and again, because we're working with the youth demographic, is WhatsApp. Um, so luckily we can send voice notes and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm obviously in the audio space. So for me, the tone of voice is very important. Uh, if you're sending a text message or an email or whatever the case is, you lose that tone. So you can't convey the emotion that you can it's by sending a voice message. So I think those kinds of things are very important. Um, we try to have weekly Zoom meetings with all of the different teams, our unit leaders, for instance, who are managing their separate departments. Um, and then obviously a program manager, you know, he's, he's just speaking to the teams on, the, on a daily basis, making sure that everyone knows exactly what they're meant to be doing. Um, I think information is key, um, giving everybody as much information as they need so everyone knows exactly what they need to be doing, what's expected of them, because I think, um, as it's so uncertain as it is, and the more uncertainty you have, the more people start to panic, the more they you know, don't know what's expected of them. Are they doing the right thing? Should they be doing something else? Um, so we over communicate at this stage um, as opposed to under communicating. Um, and in that way, everyone knows exactly where they are, where they stand, what's expected of them. Um, and in that way, we try to kind of motivate and encourage. So we've tried to keep a lot of the things that we have been doing with pre-COVID um, to be trying to continue doing them. So like I said, having our weekly meetings, uh, we still do, you know, the person who's our salesperson who's performed the best, for instance, gets a shout out, and, you know, well done, you've done the most sales for this week or this month or whatever the case is. Um, anybody who's had an amazing idea, some content on air, we congratulate them. Um, so yeah, it is difficult, but it is something that we just try to do on a weekly basis just um, by communicating a lot. Thanks, Leanne. If you'd like to ask us a question as we celebrate 10 years of the South African Radio Awards, you can do so on the live chat. A quick shout out to Anshan and Richard who have tuned in from the Free State. Vicky's in Cape Town and Harlan joins us from Paul in the Western Cape. Harlan has asked a question, uh, Kaibe, about community radio and why it's so difficult for community radio to tap into big budgets uh, on a national level like yours. Would you like to talk a little bit about um, the community sector um, and what potentially smaller radio stations can do to get onto the radar of bigger brands? I, I, I think we've got a, and it was spoken about earlier, I think both by Greg and by Gordon. One of the biggest things that our partners in the planning space will always tell us, if you're looking for audiences, you must look for reach. So you must look for big listenership. And one of the challenges, I guess, that community has is that listenership conversation. It's not necessarily an issue about whether there's people listening. It's more about the numbers of people listening, number one. Um, number two is then also when you try and look for the now BRC numbers and where do you have confirmed listenership, a lot of the community stations also you won't get the, the real, or you won't get that reading that the BRC has done, or the reading will say this is unstable or, or whatever the case is. So when you're trying to allocate budgets and you have to defend why you're allocating those budgets in pursuit of business objectives, it is always going to be easier and appropriate to be able to say, well, here's proof that these stations have got these audiences that are in our target group, and therefore we can spend a lot here and we'll be able to see results. One of the things that we had to do both a couple of years ago as well as quite recently is start to engage community stations and perhaps the sellers of community radio on a different way to say, what can we do that is again, not just about the radio from an on-air perspective, but what can we do on the ground what can we do in partnership with the station? What can we do that isn't just about advertising, but is also about educating and informing? Uh, we, we have a big uh, mandate in terms of consumer education that doesn't just talk to, in fact, almost doesn't talk to our products, is really about financial well-being and financial health. And we've engaged a lot with community stations. And again, you don't engage with all of them. <laughs> You engage with a number of them that you sort of let's start here let's see whether we can syndicate something to to the rest of the stations so so i think it's it's really about being clear about who the audience is why you want to engage and interact with that audience 
And how do you confirm that that spend that you've allocated potentially to a community radio uh, station will actually deliver what you're looking for and you'll be able to track it and prove it um, to, to the powers that be. So I think it's still something that, even though community radio has been there forever, it's still something that in, in engaging with corporates and engaging with especially our media planners and our media agencies, we probably need to find a different way to say, what are we looking for from community radio? How do we get it? And make that the selling proposition to, to the corporates. I think the reality of the situation is uh, radio sales are hard and connecting with brands are hard. And I think for smaller stations, start a, in a localized level and have a relationship with your local African bank. And that bank will then speak to their regional guy and say, look, we've got a station, we want to do something. They have an event. Can we get involved? Uh, Gordon, you want to talk a little bit about uh, community? Yeah, I, I'm very passionate about you know community radio, both in terms of the ICASA ruling as to what constitutes it and the broader sense. So 702 is arguably the first community radio station in the country. And if you look back to the struggle times, the role they played in opening dialogue, they were a genuine community. Kaya is a, is a community, even if it isn't, you know, sitting with in the ICASA silo as a community station. But the the overall awareness of community and the power of it started for me in year one of these radio awards it was mooted that we should have a community radio or or a, a people's award and my argument at the time to to the radio team was that's crazy you know people voting for their favorite station why don't we just print the award and give it to the cause the fm now they've got seven million listeners but if you go back in the records of this radio awards to year one the people station went to a station called Ubushli Bishawi. It's the community radio station in Ishawi. Now, if you've ever been to Ishawi, you know if you blink, you you know you're in Empangeni because you just you don't. There's nothing there. You just straight through. So I've always said, for me, how is it possible that a station which at the time, in terms of the radio diaries, was registering zero listeners? How could zero listeners outvote the power of a brand like uh, Ukozi or Ubushli Bishawi? It's you know, I mean, uh, 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 or Kozi or Mshobo Winemi, sorry. H how, how did that happen? That's the magic of it. And in my mind, I crystallize that into to what I call the Stargate principle. So if you're working with media these days, you have to represent, it's like the TV series or the movie, depending on your age, you go through the portal into another world. When I engage with a radio station, it's a Stargate. I, if I'm you know, engaging with Leanne on, 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 on Tux, I hope I got that right. Um, you know, I'm going into the Stargate. You're offering me access to a community. That's what you have to sell. How do you turn that into advertising uh, revenue? I don't know. Maybe you've got to shift off the, the measured you know, thousands of listeners and move into the upside of return on investment. This is what I need. I'm expecting, uh, in the case of KB, I don't know, 500 accounts to be open. And, you know, anything beyond that, we'll pay you X. Anything under that, you know, we'll, we'll come up with a different pricing model. So, you know, just selling radio time the way we've done it is the problem. You have to you change the pricing model, give that community station a stake in the upside, and then you will start to see the results. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, Greg, I'd like to move uh, into something which I'm quite passionate about, and I think it speaks to the heart and soul of potentially what Kai has done so well in the radio awards uh, this year and it's got to do around personality and the personalities that we find on our platform so social media's got a personality kai tv's got a personality uh, and your shows have all got personalities how important is the personality in our business um it's extremely important um you know the the we, we spoke at length about um, communities um, and the, the, the basic principle in any community um, is, you know, the, the relationship which is rooted in trust. Um, and it's that trust that we trade with, um, you know, Gaiwe and, and, and a variety of other people. The fact that, you know, people engage with us, they talk with us, you know, we speak the same language with the same community. We understand each other. Um, they believe us. 
Um, and for you to be able to be in that position, you then have to have the right people at the right place at the right time doing the right things consistently. Um, if you have you know, uh, an evening show, for instance, like we do, and it is a show that talks about um, you know, family issues from uh, you know, health issues you know, all the way to you know, uh, raising children, etc. cetera, um, you, you cannot have a host, A, that does not have um, a health background, B, that does not have children. Um, you know, and, and not to say that um, you know, people that don't have children can't speak about children, but you know, when someone lives the, the life that they, um, you know, that, they, that they present or project on, on radio, um, you know, it's A, far more believable when they talk to you because they're talking to you about what they know. Um, B, if they have to give an opinion which is professional, so Dr. Cindy Fanzel is an example, um, you know, understands that if she gives, you know, uh, advice based on Google or he said, she said, it's not only a risk for the show, it's a risk for herself as a professional doctor. Same as Michael Bilmutswinning, who's a lawyer who does a legal show on the station. Same as John Pullman, who's you know a a, a seasoned uh, uh, you know journalist and, and a news junkie who understands that you know his brand and the person that it is has to be um, interlinked with what the platform is about um, and has to connect with what the audience is about. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the music shows that we do on the weekends, Brenda Sasani, for instance, who does our jazz show. Uh, is the same person who was able to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, win a, a, a uh, uh, an opportunity for South Africa to host Jazz Day, and unfortunately, because of COVID, we couldn't. You know, she lives jazz; that's her life; that's what she does. And when she presents it on radio, um, it's not, you know, uh, you know, someone who, you know, is a a baker or something else just happens to do a radio show. Um, so it's very important to have, uh, you know, personalities who, you know, live their lives. I mean, we often say uh, that, you know, the person that you are on air when the mic is on has to be the exact same person uh, that you are off mic, uh, because then, you know, we, we know who and what we're dealing with. Uh, so personalities are extremely important. Having the right people can be very difficult and sometimes prove expensive, but, um, Generally, what I find is that you know, like-minded people um, will 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 gravitate towards um, you know working on a project together, you know, without even thinking about the stumbling blocks or you know the obstacles. Or you know, um, we've set up many uh, music shows with you know some of the most important people in in the music industry without even having to discuss. Okay, so what is the model behind this thing? Because people see what you know how what benefit it will be. To the audience, to the industry, to the people, um, and you're able to build on those types of things. Where now you're able to create commercial opportunities because you've built the right community, you've built it with the right personalities. You know, if you're going to do a weekend show and have a DJ um, who's a who's you know who who mixes on radio, um, you know, it has to be a Ken Zero who's a you know a, a a hip hop hall of famer, or it has to be a Louis Vega who's a Grammy award winner. You have to be you know, purposeful about, um, and there has to be intent with the people that you have. You know, it can't just be uh, people that, you know, sound, you know, that have a great voice, but, you know, are, are very thin on content. If you have a question for our panel this morning, we're joined by Gordon Miller, Kaibe Molo, Leanne Kuntz, and Greg Maloka. Uh, hit us up on the chat function on the live web stream. Leanne, you've had some good success this year. Um, and I think it boils down to your role as a manager and your team through mentorship. You've recently had uh, presenters move to Metro FM uh, and to OFM in Bloemfontein. Um, the concept of nurturing young talent is something that for two or three years uh, has been on the table. We've seen it uh, as we talk about open up the industry. We see it in online radio stations, particularly where people are getting an opportunity. How important is it to work with young talent? And what advice would you give young people who are trying to break through? It's vitally, vitally important. I mean, at the end of the day, we are feeding um, the commercial industry 
with to, their talent for tomorrow. So if that bottom level, grassroots level foundation is weak, uh, it's going to impact the entire industry at the end of the day. So it's vitally important that these this, the guys that are coming through campus level and community level are given a solid foundation of really what what it is to be you know to be able to add value to the radio industry one day when they get there to that you know the level that they're wanting to reach. Um, so it's something we focus on heavily. Um, we're very training intensive, obviously at Tax FM. We do a lot of mentorship. Um, in fact, we have um, all of our management um, serve as mentors to to our volunteers um, and the guys that we put in in management positions or leadership positions. Our volunteers themselves. They also act as mentors to the new the new volunteers that come on on board, um, just to kind of guide and help and assist wherever they may, whatever it may be, whether it's radio related or personal. Um, I think it's very very important that we kind of breed well-rounded, well-adjusted uh, young people that then feed into the commercial system. So it's, it's exceptionally important. Uh, advice I would give, I think, um, consistency has been mentioned. Um, people, you know, guys that are looking to go into the radio space need to understand that it's not only about, as Greg mentioned, you know, it's, there's no point in having a good voice. Um, you need, to, you need to understand the medium. Um, you need to know exactly what you can do and what you can't do to get the best out of it. Um, and to so therefore give the best to your listeners. Um, it's very important to to have a good training base, um, and that and you you do that by by working through campus or community level, um, kind of cut your teeth, make mistakes at that level, so that by the time you move into the commercial space, you kind of more settled and more understand the medium and what what you can can't do or should be doing um, to get the best out of it for your listeners. Thanks, Leanne. Um, I hope that answers the question, Honor. Anna is a student at, uh, or was a student at Boston Media House, uh, studied becoming a radio professional. I want to take the opportunity to say uh, hello to Justin from uh, Media Heads 360 and Paolo from Ultimate Media have joined us today, obviously quite interested uh, in the link with uh, the financing and the clients as uh, we talk radio and we celebrate the SA Radio Awards uh, in 10 years. Kaibi, do you think space for brands who are passionate about radio to work with community and commercial radio stations to help develop young talent. Because I think it would be difficult to argue that as an industry, we're doing enough to develop the next layer of radio professional, but it requires some kind of investment. Is that something brands would consider investing in talent development? Because a lot of people will acknowledge young people and that young people are the future, but we very often find it difficult to find a meaningful way to leverage them? I, I really think that it's a no-brainer. Uh, maybe it's not a no-brainer, but it's, it is, it's one of those things that <laughs> there's no, there shouldn't be any debate about it. It has to be done. Um, and I also think a lot of the brands and the corporates are already aligned to that kind of conversation. If you look at how even a lot of the industry organizations are funded by corporates. And it is a funding that a lot of corporates choose to do. Um, it's not about you are forced to do it. Uh, it's not legislation, it's not regulation. You actually choose to say, okay, yes, I'm gonna participate in this because it's in the, it's, it will benefit the industry. It will benefit, um, it will benefit, I guess, all of us. So I think there is definitely that opportunity and not only is it something that perhaps needs to be done, I think there are guys and there are, there are areas that it's already happening, perhaps in not very visible ways, um, but there are a number of stations and there are a number of individuals who actually take it upon themselves to engage the corporates, engage people in the corporates to say, can we help here? And you might not see this as a commercially based initiative. It's very much in a development initiative. Um, one of the things about the radio awards that we engage the, the guys on, we really like that idea of the development um, aspect that they have, the bursaries, um, the going out and giving um, and doing um, workshops in, in various environments. Um, and that's something that, that we do. I spoke a little bit about our consumer education um, plans, but it talks across 
not just financial, but also about general information, general education, general well-being. Where can people develop skills? Where can we identify talent? And how can we get involved, not only from the corporate social investment aspect, but also from an aspect where we will potentially use marketing budget to support initiatives that will help in developing individuals, talent, the industry at large, and I guess in developing the country. I think one of the biggest things that we're about is we definitely are always about saying, where can we get involved in advancing lives? And part of advancing lives is identifying that talent, helping to fund, because I guess, especially as a bank, often people are sort of great, it's wonderful. From you, we need money. From the grocery guys or the retailers, we are happy to take product and, and from the beverages, but from us, they look for money and where we can, we, we try and assist. Um, and you mentioned earlier, part of our involvement in some of the previous shows we've done, the Metro Awards, it's also about where are you going to spend that money that we are um, spending here? If you're not doing workshops, if you're not trying to identify talent, if you're not looking for new blood, if you're not visibly putting the money that we are perhaps partnering with you with into these kinds of environments, then we want to do it. Um, so I think definitely from our side, it's not just a taste for it. It's definitely one of our mandates. And I believe there are a number of corporates who share the same exact position. Thanks, Kaiba. We have a video recording of this, so we'll definitely be going back to you <laughs> to talk about the academy using Kaya and Tux FM in the future. Gordon, a question for you from I said, who says he operates with a bunch of restaurants who can't afford uh, television advertising, and he'd like some advice on what um, small businesses and small restaurants could do in the future, leveraging radio. In your experience uh, in the media industry, what are some quick wins for, for smaller clients who don't have the big budgets to use a platform like radio? Well, you know, if, if I heard you correctly, you said he, he doesn't have the budgets to use something like television. So the first thing he needs to do, and this is something that the radio industry needs to, to really take note of, is that I can buy television, you know, probably about 30, 40, if not 50% cheaper than I can buy radio. And really has priced itself into a very, very awkward position. But, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You just need some kind of uh, specific coding on, on, a, on a communication. So if you're using a community radio station, you have a promotion in your, re in your restaurant, there's a specific code or a specific offer, which is only available on that particular uh, uh, radio commercial, then, then you can attribute any shift in your business to that. So... Again, take the upside pricing deal. You know, the radio, average radio spot would include a margin for the station. So play into that space. You need to cover the cost of broadcast and the cost of people getting involved, all that kind of thing. But, you know, you, you, you can play, you can play the, the shared joint venture approach with radio stations. I have never once at any stage in my career worked with, with a radio station that has declined an offer to partner responsibly uh, with with an advertiser, they're not going to give you free space, nor should they. But if you if you work with the guys, and you know, and if there's a natural fit, um, you know, if you try to force, you know, I, I've said it many times before. And young guys, if you're single out there, you know, you should listen to this. Never at any stage in your life, Greg's laughing at me. I can see him. You you can't because he's heard the story before. Never ever tell a mother, especially if she's a first time mother, that she has an ugly baby. Okay, this is a relationship killer, the highest order. The problem is many of the marketers I work with have got products which are ugly babies. So if you want a radio station to partner with you and your ugly baby, and they turn you down, best you go and get the baby's ears fixed, or you drop the price, or you, you, know, you do what you need to do on your side. So too many marketers, I think, are trying to partner with radio stations, but getting wanting radio stations to take all the risk, that's daft. That's not going to happen. Um, just to come back as well, if I may quickly, to comment on something Kaibi said on, on young voices as well. You know, young voices need to be identified right across the spectrum of South Africa. And if we continue 
to in, in, invest the vast majority of advertising in English. We are just, we are just going, not going to find those voices. The biggest shift that has to happen if we want to build young talent across the board, and if my colleague Napster is out there listening, something he feels passionate about as well, you have got to invest in, in indigenous languages as well so that the talent pool is not restricted to the, you know, the kids that come from St. John's or Rodean School. That's just a non-starter for me. Yeah. Gordon, I couldn't agree more. One of the things that uh, I battle to understand, especially with technology the way that it's moving now, and with young people, when they, whenever I speak to them, they always say, well, how do I make my break? I say, well, find yourself a space that you're comfortable in a topic that you want to talk about in a language that you're comfortable in and create a podcast. It doesn't matter where you put it. Um, and I think the investment from places like the Pan-African Language Board, Arts and Culture, there's a huge scope to help and develop Indigenous language uh, and speak to people. I mean, that's the thing that radio has always done. We've connected with people in a way that is home for them in a language which is key to them. So I couldn't agree more. Greg, a question has come through regarding the use of celebrities um, on radio stations. So uh, young people often say, well, you know, I've spent time in community radio. I've been doing my best to get through it. Then all of a sudden you go and hire someone who's got a following and makes the Sunday newspapers. Um, what's your take on hiring celebrities um, in a radio space? Um, I, well, I mean, you know, we don't, we don't have celebrities on Kaya. So I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, you know, we, this question often, um, you know, comes to me. I, you know, I, I started my, my radio career um, at, uh, you know, Technico Noor Transvaal, or others know it as TNT or Technico Nice Time. Doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's you know, all these permutations to it. Um, <laughs> and, and that was a that was a campus radio station that um, you know broadcast only to the cafeteria, um, and we moved it from cafeteria to a community license, um, and you know we put in the work to create a very strong community campus community radio station in 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 this the community of Social Movie, which is in, in Pretoria North, um, and. You know, moving to YFM, um, you know, there was always the one thing that kept that thread was, you know, the the need, the hunger, the desire, but have something to offer. You've got to have something to offer. Uh, so everyone who, you know, who came to Y and who ended up on air on Y, in fact, many others that didn't end up on air, you know, had a purpose, and 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 there was this shared purpose. There was a, there was a common vision, um, and I think. Generally, people, you know, um, treat people who are celebrities unfairly because you build yourself to become a celebrity. You don't just, you know, wake up a celebrity. This is, uh, you know, we are very different to Western worlds where, you know, if a famous couple have a baby, the baby is famous from day one. Um, a lot of famous people in South Africa have had to work hard towards their fame. And I think where they're able to, trade and convert that fame into, um, you know, uh, fortune for the platforms they work for and for themselves. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think there's absolutely everything wrong with the wrong person being in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong things. I think those things are, are you know, they need to be, you know, looked at quite closely. Um, you know, we, we are obviously, you know, somewhat envious of some celebrities because sometimes, you know, people's natural thing is to compare. You know, you look at someone, you're like, oh, but, you know, just because they're a celebrity, they're getting this. Well, yes, they are a celebrity. They've got lots of viewers. They've got a lot of things to offer. They've got a lot of value to offer. What do you have to offer? And that's the question that a lot of young people need to ask themselves. And if we have nothing to offer, no one will pay attention to you. So, in, in developing um, talent, uh, which is where we should be focusing, we should be able to, um, you know, teach young people about, you know, being able to offer value, um, and and how you realize that value, and how you quantify that value, and how you trade that value. All these things have to come with, um, you know, the talent that people have. You know, it's 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 like a relationship. You know, love is not enough, even in a marriage. You, you can't just like and say love, that's it. There's a whole host of other things 
that you've got to be able to master. And you work on it on a daily basis. You know, you don't just rest on your laurels and say, I've got a great voice and before I can do X, Y, Z. Um, and, and just picking up on, 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 you know, community and language and all those different things, just to, to illustrate the point even further. Um, you know, we have Skumba, who does our breakfast show on Friday. Um, and Skumba was the person who, um, you know, um, helped us prove a case for Kaya TV because we took what we were doing for five minutes with him and Bob Mavena on, on the morning show, put that onto YouTube to prove that people can, you know, move from radio to go into a visual, you know, because of the nature of that particular uh, person and then moved it onto, um, you know, Kaya TV and then, you know, created a, a whole package that was able to uh, support you know, some of his one-man shows. I mean, he's, you know, and I'll speak on the correction, probably the most viewed comedian on YouTube in the country, the most viewed uh, comedian on, you know, digital television, the BM and Kaya. Um, you know, he has the highest number by far of successful one-man shows, um, you know, that is done in theaters and in variety of venues across the country, working from a regional, you know, radio station. This is, for me, a, a very clear demonstration of, you know, it doesn't matter that you don't sound like you speak English very well. In fact, you love your language and, and that's, that's your strength and that's your superpower. You used it in your talent. You used it to create relevance. You know, you literally grew from, uh, you know, zero followers to 50, you know, uh, thousand or odds and, and close to, you know, thousands of people that are following you, you know, so, so you have reached celebrity status um, and, and you've got to be able to leverage the celebrity status even further. I mean, if, you know, another platform, you know, wants to take him, you know, even further and he feels he wants to do that, he, you know, you can't discount the fact that he grew into that space and that, you know, it, there was a lot of work that went into, you know, creating that particular brand. So, so it's a very important balance. For me, it's about people. It's not about celebrity or not, it's about the right decision, it's about the content you have, it's about your ability to connect with the audience in a meaningful way. We've got eight minutes to go as we celebrate 10 years of the South African Radio Awards. We're saying hi to Mac Peary, who joins us from Zambia, and Silla's joining us from France. Uh, Greg, you've answered a lot of questions uh, in your last section. Um, Kai is not only the commercial station of the year, you also have uh, your programmer, Neil Johnson, inducted into the Hall of Fame. This concept of mentorship at station level, um, do you think that the old guard in inverted commas of radio could be doing more in terms of mentorship with younger people? So a guy like Neil, is there space for him to be working with younger people? If we take a look at Brian Oxley, who also was inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, should he be doing more in Cape Town with young people? Where's the, where are we dropping the ball between the old generation and the new generation? But I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a radio only challenge. I mean, I think it's a, it's a country challenge. Um, you know, it's a, it's a challenge in, in the marketing environment, in the media environment. In, you know, there's, we have a lot of gaps in this country. There's gaps between age, there's gaps between sexes, there's gaps between um, uh, races. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a very basic thing that we've got to build as a people and as a country, um, you know, where, where we have to understand you know, that South Africa, um, for, for South Africa and Africa to, to continue uh, succeeding and thriving, you know, these generations have got to start blending and blending meaningfully. Um, and where there's been great examples, you see a lot of progress. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm on this, you know, conversation now with Gaibe, who I've worked with, you know, for over 20 years in the, in the business, you know, building brands, um, you know, building media, building communities, building all sorts of spaces. Um, but, you know, I'm a Gordon Muller student, you know. Um, I mean, I was the guy who was giving Gordon gray hairs. I'm responsible for half the gray hairs on his, on his head. Um, you know, and Gordon has been around for the longest time. And we've built that relationship, you know, over the years. And we've kept in touch and we've worked together. So you're able to see that there's been, you know, uh, connections. But, you know, um, and, and classic example is, you know, I've met Leah and we've spoken a few times, but we haven't maintained that connection, you know. So, and this is a classic example of, 
uh, where we fall short. There are things that we get right. Um, and then there are things that we just don't, don't follow up on. So absolutely, the, the old guard, so to speak, have a huge responsibility uh, towards training young people. Connecting with people, that's what radio is good at. And sometimes I think as practitioners, we need to remind ourselves that we're in the communication business and we need to communicate better. We're coming to the end of the session today as we celebrate 10 years of the South African Radio Awards. Um, I'd like to give each panelist an opportunity uh, to have some uh, parting thoughts. Gordon, I'd like to start with you as someone who's worked uh, on the client-facing side and has utilized the medium for such a long time. Uh, what tips would you give radio practitioners for the rest of 2020 to ensure that uh, there's a success to this business beyond COVID-19? Yeah, I, th I think you need to start with the recognition that if I am a digital native, my definition is the chances are I'm a radio immigrant. So your, your first dynamic you know, is to shift your sales pitch away from selling audiences and go back to fundamentals. And one of the fundamentals is something which we've just taken for granted over the years, the power of sound. There are many, many creative people that I've worked with in agencies who don't have an instinctive feel for, for radio. And you have to recreate that, that radio. You have to get back to the creative guys. If I'm sitting downstream in a media department trying to create energy for radio, but I'm trying to sell a medium to people who don't have a feel for it, who don't believe in it at a fundamental core level, then there's a problem. So I would say from the radio point of view, go back to basics and start selling from the client side. From the, from the client side, we've already addressed, you know, a radio station is a stargate. It's a portal. It's a brand. Engage with the brand um, at, you know, at, at a core level. And then finally, on the user-generated content, don't think that, you know, having people call in is user-generated content. That's not user-generated content. Just because I'm interested in my life doesn't make my life interesting. I mean, I blame it on fridge magnets. You, you know, you, you, kids have been taught since the age of two that their works of art are, are magnificent and should be on display. We're not all of us works of art. Some of us are incredibly dull. And then a final comment, Greg, I find myself in a remarkable position where because of my age, I, I'm going to have to stay at home. I'm not allowed to contribute anymore because I'm a liability in the first <laughs> If you can tell me how to get around that one, but I'm going to be right in there doing everything I can to have a chat to Big Cyril and ask him if he can just, even if it's one day a week, let me out the house, despite my appalling age. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. Kaibe, you're laughing at the moment. Um, radio has been a medium that you've utilized a lot um, in the campaigns that you've run on the brands that you've worked with. Uh, your part for radio practitioners and radio stations uh, 2020? Um, I couldn't agree more with everything that Pragorin said um, respecting the gray hair. Um, <laughs> but I think there's, there's one part of that that for me is critical. It is that connection. You know, one of the things for me that I've realized about a number of us, when we worry and you're thinking to yourself, a lot of us who are not English first speakers. We don't worry in English. We worry in our mother tongues. So if we worry in our mother tongues, even the solutions we're looking for are often in our mother tongues and the connections and the engagements we're looking for are in our, in our mother tongues. So again, radio actually has that with the sound, with the audio, with the, with the fact that just listening to something makes you think and access something else. The power of radio is, is I mean, it's, it's beyond comparison. Um, and with how far it goes into the country, um, th there really should be no, no reason why 2020 can't be perhaps the beginning of the next step in radio. So that it's not just about what is on air, it's actually about what this platform is, this tool for mass engagement many people, different environments with a common message, but talking not just to their mind, but most importantly, talking to their heart. Excellent, thank you, Kaive. Uh, Leanne, uh, someone who's working with young people uh, who've come from a campus environment, um, who's had great success in the last two years, 
Um, 2020 in the radio industry, if you were to give us a parting shot, what would it be? I think, as you mentioned, um, radio, the radio space as a whole needs to look at nurturing the youth markets more, um, engaging with them more, trying to attract them to the platform or to the, to the, the FM feed more. I think, obviously, um, the youth market being digital natives have got so many different options available to them in terms of entertainment or information or just kind of breaking away from the norm. Um, and so as a result, we're seeing a drop in, in listenership among the youth market, which for me is exceptionally scary because at the end of the day, um, if this eroding of the youth listenership figure is going to impact later on as they get older um, and there's more available to them, more you know, digital options um, for them to entertain themselves, inform themselves, whatever the case is. So I think it's very important for the radio community as a whole to be looking at ways to engage more with the youth market, to remind them of radio's power and what it is that we can offer them in terms of entertainment, information, education, whatever the case may be, so that we can build that foundation to more for the future, well, the future of radio, really. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Greg, as we start queuing the bed music with 60 seconds to go, um, your parting shot on uh, the SA uh, Radio Awards for 2020 and the way forward for our business as we navigate some rather uncertain water. Uh, well, for starters, I mean, I think congratulations again to uh, all the winners. Uh, you know, for us, four times in five years is a big achievement for an awards uh, event that's only been around 10 years. Um, it's been a wonderful platform and it will continue to be a wonderful platform to raise the bar. Uh, and, but most importantly, um, you know, create these, these networks, these connections that, that all of us need to follow up on. Um, you know, I, you know, I've I've uh, I've enjoyed with my team, uh, you know, being being a part of this space. When your peers say to you, you know, you hold the torch, it's a huge responsibility. Um, and I think, you know, we we are as good as you know uh, the connections that we make and, and and the people that we bring along uh, in in that particular space. We will, you know, continue to uh, put in a lot of our efforts in in, in development of young people. Um, Leanne, if we don't call each other by the end of lockdown, I mean, that's the end of our relationship, really. <laughs> um, these are the things that are important. You know, these are the things that, uh, that I think the, the Radio Awards have, been, have afforded us as an industry to do. You know, we're reconnecting with you know, old friends, new friends. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to, to carry on this tradition. Thanks very much, Greg. And this brings us to the end of today's conversation. If you've enjoyed the conversation and you have any other topics that you think you'd like to hear from the radio industry about, do put them in the comments section um, and the team at uh, Arena Events uh, will definitely take that into consideration. Today, we've joined, been joined by uh, Kaibe Molo, who's the head of marketing at African Bank, uh, South Africa's oldest media strategist and planner, uh, Gordon Miller, he's a podcaster um, and he writes regularly on his blog. Go and check it out. Some really good insight. Leanne Kuntz is the station manager at Tux FM. Find her on Twitter. She's at Leanne Kuntz. Greg Maloka is the music man. Uh, Greg, in the words of B.B. Winans, I want to say thank you for your time this morning. Uh, my name is Tim Zunkel. Uh, you can check me out, www.timzunkel.co.za. And I've just used someone else's airtime for my own gain. Thanks very much for joining us. <laughs> we hope to see you again. Uh, we've celebrated the SA Radio Awards of 10 years. And uh, check out the platform. It's a great way to celebrate this business. Have a safe day and be good. <laughs>